Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Newton Church of the Way. Uh, glad you're here with us. If you're a visitor here with us, welcome. Would you pray with me, please? Father God, as, as we come before your word today, Lord, there's, a, there's an acknowledgement that we have to make, and that's that we are oftentimes prone to wander in the ways we look at life and the ways we look at things. And, and Lord, I thank you for your word, which helps us to, to continue to know and understand what your truth really is. Lord, in your word today, you reveal to us something about your heart, something that makes you happy and gives you joy as a people that are constantly aware of what makes us happy and what doesn't make us happy and what gives us joy and what doesn't give us joy. Lord, could we as a people focus ultimately just today for a moment on what gives you joy? So Lord, use your word today with power over our hearts and help us to share your heart. We pray this all in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Uh, just an FYI, uh, I'm just going to take a minute to kind of state the obvious, but if y'all are hot here uh, and you guys are sitting on the sides, you have free control over the windows. So this place, this place is like a living nightmare to try to get the temperature. We start out in the morning at like 50 degrees, and then by the, by the time we get to the third service, it's like 75 degrees in here. So uh, we just don't have a real good system in here, but we have windows, and so if you're hot... Uh, uh, and if you're on the inside, give that look to the person on the outside like, what are you waiting for? <laughs> so uh, just an FYI, uh, but uh, it, part of the reason why it gets warm in here is because there's so many people, so uh, the warm is okay, right? Uh, but we are going to be returning uh, to the book of Luke. Uh, we're going to be uh, jumping and joining back. Uh, if, if you've been with us uh, kind of over the long haul, Really, over the last year, we've been working our way through the book of Luke, and, and then we took a break during the Christmas season, uh, but now we're going to reconnect. Now, over the last several weeks, I have been kind of sharing with you our mission and our vision here at The Way, and I, I want to remind you, like I said at the beginning of the service, uh, if you want to hear that, our, our services are recorded, and they're on our Facebook site, or they're on our website, newtonway.org, and, and you can go back to listen to those. Uh, why, why is it so important that we, that we talk about these things and as we come back to our text, it's important that you understand one thing. And, and I cannot stress this enough. It's important that you understand what God is doing. Because we, we as a people, can't, are, we're prone to wonder. Not like, I wonder. We're prone to wander. We get lost. We, we get into things that aren't good for us, and we, and we move into things that God doesn't want for us. And when we do that, we lose our perspective. I, I want to just give you an example, and I, I'm not picking on anybody in particular. I, and I'm using broad brush strokes. I know in a room like this that there's all kinds of different people from all kinds of different places with the Lord. But could you bring up that last verse again on the screen? If you could, please, Patty. Oftentimes in a church, there's two kinds of people that are singing. There are those that are just singing words, and there are those that understand the words that they're singing. Let me remind you what we just sang. Savior, He can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He's mighty to save forever. Author of salvation, He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. Now what amazes me is we can sing such powerful things in church and we can sing it kind of like, yeah, Savior, yeah, He can move the mountains and uh, yeah, what's, what's going on outside there? Right? Why do we do that? And, and what is up with that? You see, I want to warn you against, against what is religiosity, American, Western, European, uh, churchianity, which is, and, and I rail on this all the time, these are lies, these are lies, these are lies. Never, ever, ever lose perspective what the point of what Jesus' ministry is, 
and the point of why we're here never ever lose perspective of what what is at stake i uh um i wanted to take you back before we we're going to be hooking up at luke 15 but i want to take you back uh, to the beginning of jesus's ministry in luke chapter 4 now one of the things you have to know about god uh, that's different than us i mean many things but just one, one in particular people oftentimes say things with good intentions but they don't carry through okay i i, I hope that doesn't come as a newsflash to people uh, but sometimes people do that god never ever does that god never says anything for nothing when god says what he's going to do he does it and so as we start to, you know, as we start to kind of try to redefine in our minds who God is, and we come before the Word of God and we hear what God is doing and what He cares about, uh, you have to know that's not going to change. God's not going to wake up one day and say, oh, well, you know what, that was fun for a while, but I'm done now. Okay, God is eternal, and He says what He means, and He does what He says Let's go back to the beginning of Jesus' ministry in the book of Luke. This is right after Jesus comes out of the wilderness, being tempted by Satan himself. He comes out, he begins his ministry, preaching in synagogues. He comes to Nazareth in Luke 4, verse 18. He quotes from Isaiah 61, and this is what he says. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim that captives will be released, Blind will see, the oppressed will be set free, and that the time of the Lord's favor has come. Now is an age of grace. We live in an age of grace. Jesus' ministry, when He came on this earth, He entered in this, this way of grace for people to come back to God. And, and that's not changing. Anytime, eventually, when Jesus returns, that age will end. But until he returns, this is what God is doing. Why is that so important to understand? Because, see, somewhere in our thinking, church becomes about just comfort. Or it's almost like, it, it, it's kind of like going to a movie. Sometimes we like the movie, sometimes we don't like the movie. Or, or sometimes, you know, it, it's all these various things. But we've lost perspective that ultimately what the church is called to do, what we are called to do as individuals, is we are on a mission to liberate prisoners. And, and we can't ever forget that. i I got to tell you, if you're looking for a book recommendation, let me give you a great book recommendation. I just finished reading the book Unbroken. And many of you may have seen the movie. I hear that the movie isn't anywhere near as good as the book. It never is, really, is it? But I read that book, and it's a book about a man named Louis Zamperini. If you're not familiar with who he is, he was an Olympic long-distance runner. who uh, he, In World War II, he, of course, he joined, he joined the military, and he was on a B-24 bomber, uh, and he was stationed uh, in the Pacific. And he actually, his plane on a search and rescue mission crashed into the ocean, into the Pacific Ocean, and only three, I think it's a contingent of nine, they had on a B-24, out of the nine, three survived, three survived, and, and he and two, and the, the pilot and another uh, guy on his plane, they were set adrift on two little, uh, like six foot by three foot rafts for 47 days. At the end of the 47 days, they were picked up by the Japanese. They had drifted into Japanese waters. That Because they were with the B-24 bomber, they actually didn't put them in a POW camp. They moved them to an interrogation camp, uh, which was off the radar of the Red Cross and, the, and the, the POWs. They put them there, and their purpose of putting them there was to break them mentally because they wanted an information that they had about the... Americans' capabilities in the Pacific. And the things that they did to break these men was horrific. And the whole book is about, you know, Louis and, and his guys and how they're persevering and enduring. Uh, if, if you know the story, there was one uh, particular person that, that made it his mission daily to, to, to hurt and humiliate Louis Zamperini, and they called him the bird, uh, uh, this, this infamous, uh, uh, he was a... Uh, he was a colonel. No, he was a 
Sorry, he was a corporal that became a sergeant. Um, but anyway, the point is, is that when they were liberated, it was this big, huge, massive deal. Now, let me ask you this. If, if somebody were to say to you tomorrow, hey, guess what? There's been this POW camp where our own people, our Americans, have been tortured for two and a half years. I would like your help to go liberate them. I'd like your help to feed them. I'd like your help to help them uh, for the first time in two and a half years talk to their families. I would like you to be there when they're set free. How many of you would say, oh, but I've got laundry that day? You know, I'd love to do that, but uh, you don't understand, uh, I've got so many other things i got to do. Or how many of you would say, I would give anything to see these people set free? I would love to be there when they're given their freedom and they know they've made it. And see, as Christians, we have to know that this is what our God is calling us into. He wants to set the captives free. And, he, and, he, and this now is the time of the Lord's favor. It's about liberation. And so we, when we make it something other than that, we lose perspective. And we blow it as a church and as Christians. We make it things that it shouldn't be. Jesus said, uh, after he said, after he, uh, he quoted Isaiah 61, he went on, he rolled up the scroll, verse 20, he handed it back to the attendant, he sat down, all eyes in the synagogue looked at him intently, and then he began to speak to them. The scripture you just heard has been fulfilled this very day. This is what Jesus is doing. Now we can make it all kinds of other things. But when we do that, we're losing perspective. And I want to confess, and I've been doing this all weekend, just on the behalf of a lot of churches, that we, we blow this. We get kind of twisted in our thinking. And, and, and instead of doing the very things that, that Jesus wants to do, we find ourselves pushing back against what He wants to do. And I want you to see that in our text today. So I want to, I want to take you to Luke chapter 15. This is where we're going to begin this is a monumental scripture for me personally. It really shaped my entire my thinking in ministry and, 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 and just so much of the way that I, I just, my perspective on life in general. Uh, so I'm hoping it has the same effect for you to some degree. But we begin out, Luke 15, uh, before we begin with verse 1, remember in, in, those of you that have been a part of our Luke series, who have the antagonists or the enemies of Jesus been throughout his ministry? The Pharisees, teachers of religious law, otherwise known as the religious people. One of the great ironies about Jesus' ministry, it was religious leaders and religious people that opposed him. And eventually it was religious leaders that delivered him to the Romans to be crucified. Which is kind of interesting. And I, I've used that connection that the religious leaders and the religious people of that age are kind of like the church people of today. And so we have to be careful because there's a little bit of Pharisee in every single one of us. So I want to take us to our, te to our scripture and I want to show you what I'm talking about and, and, and hopefully uh, help us regain a proper perspective in the ways we, we think about Jesus' ministry. So Luke 15, starting with verse 1. Tax collectors and other notorious sinners often came to listen to Jesus teach. This made the Pharisees and teachers of religious law complain that he was associating with such sinful people, even eating with them. So I want to stop right there because that sets the context for where we're going. Tax collectors. Now, I don't think there's a lot of us today that are thrilled with tax collectors. But let me just tell you that this, let, let, me, let me tell you what this was. And let me also tell you why you should maybe go a little easier on tax collectors today than, than we do in our thinking. 2,000 years ago, this is what a tax collector was. A tax collector was a person, uh, let, let, me give you, let me give you a word picture here that might help you. Imagine if a foreign invading army comes here into America. They invade America, they impose a, 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 a power structure that oppresses and suppresses the people. Part of that uh, power structure is they empower a local tax collector. 
And his job is to basically take everything that he can from you. Now what he does is he sends a percentage off to the occupying force. Let's say it's Russia. Russia, you know, I don't know why I pick Russia, but, you know, I just imagine that we're all, you know, being oppressed by the Russians. They invaded America. They, or let's say the Taliban. The Taliban invades America and they impose their law and their rules and they're oppressing us and forcing us to submit to their, and in, as a part of that, they empower a local person, a local community person that would, that would take as much money from you as they could. They'd send a percentage off to the occupying force and then they got to keep the rest. And while everybody else is, is, being, is being taxed to the point of destruction, you're building a bigger, more palatial, more beautiful home on a hill. Now, how do you think you would feel about somebody that was doing that? That was a tax collector 2,000 years ago. Now, we can criticize, we, you know, we, may, we can say we want about tax collectors today, but, you know, ultimately the money they collect is going to, you know, highways and roads and, and things, you know, and stuff around us. Uh, it, it's not done in a similar manner. But how would you feel about the way that it was 2,000 years ago, the Romans were occupying the, the area of Israel today, and they were empowering local Jews to be tax collectors, and these people were, were literally selling their souls for money. And they took from everybody, gave a percentage to the Romans, and then kept the rest. These are the tax collectors. And so, uh, obviously, the Pharisees and the teachers of religious law are furious uh, that Jesus is, a, they, they were despised, they were hated, they were shunned, and here's Jesus hanging out with them. Now, the other notorious sinners, uh, these are people that are obvious sinners. Uh, you know, what prostitutes, uh, uh, you know, uh, alcoholics, I, I don't know what it would be, but people that are just outwardly, they're notorious, they're known, um, and to some degree, they, they almost kind of flaunt it. Notorious sinners. The Pharisees and the teachers of religious law looked at these people. They saw Jesus hanging out with them. These people were coming to listen to Jesus teach. And they started complaining. The word actually, if you break it down, it's the, it's the word grumbling. Grumble, grum, you know. Uh, church people know how to grumble, right? We've got that. <laughs> grumbling. They were grumbling and that he was associating with such sinful people, even eating with them. Now, before we kind of, again, point this to the Pharisees and the teachers of religious law, folks, that, all, that happens today. Church people and religious people are still doing that today. We are looking at certain people, and we are making a judgment that they're just not part of the deal. Uh, ask this question in your mind everybody if they're truthful even though they won't really admit it we have in our mind a line where maybe when we think about reaching out to the lost or seeking and saving the lost there's a line that if somebody is on the other side we think to ourselves they're too lost think about certain kinds of crimes that a person could commit and you may think to yourself well they're beyond redemption. And see, that in itself, that's kind of a pharisaic line of thinking. Imagine if you would, how would you feel if a highly, a, a religious leader that you really, really respect, let's say it's Billy Graham, I don't know, think of your person, and let's say in the, you open up the newspaper tomorrow, and there's Billy Graham sitting there having lunch, smiling and, and hugging. Uh, I, I've used this example all weekend, and I, I don't know if it's a good example, but it just works for me. But there's Billy Graham hugging Marilyn Manson. And they're looking. And the reason why I use Marilyn Manson, if you know who he is, he just looks weird. <laughs> right? Can you imagine Billy Graham and Marilyn Manson going, <laughs> at, at the camera? There would be religious people that would be going, why is Billy Graham associating with that man? And it just says that they just, they've just agreed to start having lunch. And you might say, well, you know, maybe Marilyn Manson's come, come to know Jesus or, or something like that. But what if he's just, no, he's not. We would struggle with that. Uh, and, and so we do. We struggle with certain things. We believe that there's a line. Um, and and I, this is kind of the area where I just want to tell you that churches blow this all the time. Churches get this wrong. 
And instead of having the proper perspective in the heart of God, we, we just we become working against Him. I, I got to share this story with you, and it just breaks my heart, but you know, yesterday when the Ark of the Way had their, uh, they had their event, um, some, a, a young woman came up to some, one of the volunteers and said, uh, I, I'd like to attend your church. Uh, would, would it be okay if I, if I came to your church? And, and, and the person thought, well, sure, yeah, come on. And he said, but you don't understand, I, I, have, I have a lot of tattoos. And actually, the last church I went to, they asked me to leave because of my tattoos. And I, and I heard that story, and I thought to myself, are you kidding me? Do you mean to tell me as Christians, we think God's mercy and grace ends at our skin? I mean, does that make any sense? You can have a personal thought about tattoos, whether you like them or whether you don't like them. That's a personal thought. But for, you, for anybody who's a Christian to believe that God's mercy and grace ends at skin ink, that's just ridiculous. But we think that. We, we get that in our mind. I had another example just happened to me last night. I had a guy that came here and, and he visited and, and as he was walking out, I said, hey, glad you're here tonight. And he said, I'll be back. My wife told me it's okay if I wear my bibs. <laughs> and he was wearing his bibs. And I said, of course it's okay if you wear your bibs to church. I go, just make sure if there's any manure on there, you shake it off before you come in. <laughs> and he goes, oh, he laughed at that. <laughs> but isn't it funny how we think that there are limitations to coming to hear Jesus? And we just, that's religion, folks. That is religion. Now, here's, here's where we get, here's, here's where we have to be careful. There is a holiness and a righteous to God, righteousness to God that can never, ever be compromised on. God is holy. He's holy, 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 all righteous, but He's also filled with grace. So, so the way that you apply this practically and the way that you kind of you get this in the proper perspective is anybody is invited to hear the words of Jesus. They're invited into a relationship with Jesus. It's from that moment on that as they walk with Christ that they learn to, about the holiness and the righteousness of God. It's a process that happens in the life of a believer. It's called sanctification. And we become more and more, as we follow Jesus, we become more and more holy and righteous in the ways that we live our lives. But everybody has to start somewhere. And so what we can't say is you can only start if you're here anybody can start from anywhere it's all about what jesus christ is doing as a church we have to say it doesn't matter what you look like it doesn't matter how you dress it doesn't matter what your education level what your income class is we're all the same when we stand before christ and everyone is invited and so that's who we have to be as a church so we have this situation where these pharisees are angry at jesus and jesus answers them but he doesn't give them a direct answer he gives them two stories two parables which is what i want to uh, bring us to now that these two parables that he tells the way to approach a parable is it's a story that inside there's a deeper meaning and so we approach a parable and we seek the deeper meaning within the story itself so that's what we're going to do so let's begin that we begin with verse three uh, and we it says jesus told them this story if a man has a hundred sheep and one of them gets lost, what will he do? Won't he leave the 99 others in the wilderness and go to search for the one that is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he will joyfully carry it home on his shoulders. And when he arrives, he will call together his friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me because I have found my lost sheep. This is where we're going to unpack this. So as we start to try to figure out what the deeper meaning in this story is, there, there are three primary uh, group, groupings of people within this story. You have the shepherd, you have the lost sheep, and you have the friends and the neighbors. So let's ask this question as we work through this. Who does the shepherd represent? Jesus. Now we can speak out loud. It's okay, I'm inviting you to... Speak out loud in church. Okay, so the shepherd represents Jesus. Who 
does the sheep represent? Us, as individuals. Who do the friends and the neighbors represent? The church. The church. Okay, so it's important we understand that. Okay, so we have the shepherd, which is Jesus, God. We have the lost sheep, which is us as individuals. And we have the friends and the neighbors, which is uh, the church, which is the body, the flock, as it would, as it would be. So let, let's go back and start to unpack this. So first, as Jesus talks this story about a shepherd, the man who has a hundred sheep, kind of an interesting thing about shepherds 2,000 years ago, these people were kind of nutty, okay, just to be honest. They were so dedicated to their sheep that they lived, ate, and slept alongside of their sheep, right? And so they would be out, they'd be out in the pasture land, they'd be out in the woods, and they would be out there with their sheep. And they, you know, they were kind of social outcasts. They didn't, not a whole lot of uh, bathing water out there amongst the sheep, uh, unless they actually have to cross a, ri- a cr- creek or a river or something. I mean, it's just these, they're just kind of, but Jesus, by, by, by putting the, himself as this man with a hundred sheep, a shepherd, he's showing the commitment level. A shepherd would lay down, a good shepherd would lay down his life for his sheep. He, he's with his sheep all the time. He's constantly tending to, caring for, searching for his sheep. And so that, that paints this picture of God. Now, the sheep is kind of an interesting picture for us. How many people here, if you were traipsing through the woods, you came around a corner and there was a wild sheep looking you in the face would be afraid? Sheep are kind of helpless, aren't they? Harmless, helpless. If you saw a wild sheep, your first inclination would be, oh, how cute, I'm going to pet you. Right? If you turned on the news tonight, and there was a breaking news story that a truck turned over, and a herd of sheep were on the loose in your community, how many of you would be scared? Right? This is sheep. Sheep are harmless. And sheep, uh, let me take you to a step further. Sheep are, are, are so... Uh, dumb <laughs> uh, that they actually they don't even like if they wander off that it never really occurs to them at any point to look around and say oh um i'm by myself i better go back to where i came from they don't actually know where they just came from sheep are kind of wherever they're at that's where they're at that's the moment they're living in if they're there they're there and so it's this idea sheep get lost they're prone to wander and they don't find their way back Another interesting thing about sheep is they're so helpless that, and I've told you this story before, that if a sheep ends up on its back, it'll actually flounder and it just lays there with its legs up in the air. It doesn't know to turn over and stand up. It just kind of sits there and goes, what do I do now? I'm just going to lay here and bah. Right? That's, that's sheep. Who are the sheep in the story? Y'all aren't raising your hand now, are you? right but but let me let me and and please hear the grace with all that's intended here and and hear my heart on this we need a shepherd because we do get lost one of the things you have to understand about god when it comes to sin and i've told you this before he's not a fun hater he doesn't sit there look down at us and say oh oh you know what they're just having way too much fun doing that um i'm gonna make that sin and tell them they can't do it anymore not how god rolls god looks at what sin does to us and how it wounds us it damages us it screws up our lives and he sees that he says i don't like that i love you i have a better way for you but we see we're stubborn and we just we're willful and we get lost and we wander off and we keep going after things that are harmful to us And God is sitting there saying, no, return to me. I'm the good shepherd. I know what's best for you. But people were, we just were our own worst enemy. We just don't believe it. If you take and you break so many dysfunctional things down, you know, sometimes we turn to alcohol. Sometimes we turn to drugs. Sometimes we turn to, to sexual behavior. Sometimes we turn to, to greediness or, or, or you know, gambling or, or all kinds of different things 
that destroy lives rather than turning to God. Why do we do that? I don't know why we do it. But the point is, there is no reason to not turn to God. Because He loves you. And He's not going to sit there and He's not going to look at you and say, well, you're too lost. He doesn't do that. The way has been made for anybody to turn to God. Now that doesn't mean we're going to live these perfect lives. But it does mean that when we turn to God, that He is going to be a part of our lives, showing us the way and helping us be who it is He wants us to be. And when we turn to God, He is filled with joy. Uh, he, it's, you get this picture that when he, he searches for the one that is lost until He finds it. That's the commitment of God. Would you keep searching for a lost cell phone? Maybe for a while. But eventually you're going to get to a point, it's like, you know what, that really stinks, but it's gone, I don't know where it is, I'm going to move on, I'm going to get another one. Right? I mean, I've been there. <laughs> I searched for a while, and then I, I, I decided it, it wasn't worth my time and effort anymore, so I just got a new one. What if you lost your child? Anybody here have that same conclusion about a child? Absolutely not. You would search, and you would search, and you would search, and you would search. We, we hear cases of parents that have lost their children to various things, and they are still searching 20, 30 years later. This is the commitment level of God. I, that, he says, when one is lost, I, search for, I go out to the wilderness and search for the one that is lost until I find it relentless never ending and then when the good shepherd finds the lost sheep he doesn't walk up to it with the staff and beat it and say get get back get back to the flock here you go he doesn't kick it say get back to the flock the good shepherd bends over picks up this sheep lays it on his shoulders and joyfully carries it back to the flock and that's this picture of God. I think sometimes we think that if we turn back to God, He's going to somehow come down on us or, or somehow steal our joy or fun. When in reality, He's got this much bigger blessing that He has for us. And when He arrives, He calls together His friends and neighbors saying, Rejoice with me because I found my lost sheep. That's this picture of the joy that the church experiences when we're a part of what Jesus is doing, if you are not, if you have no heart for what Jesus Christ is doing, you're going to miss the joy. I'll just tell you right now, if to you, church is a building, like a movie theater, where you go every so often, and, and you get something, and maybe, maybe you like the movie, maybe you don't like the movie, and then when it's over, you go home, you get back to your life, and then maybe you go back, you know, maybe you go back next week, maybe you, whenever. If that to you is church, I just want to tell you, you're missing everything. You are missing it. Church is about participating in God's liberation of prisoners. And when they're freed, they come and they receive love and support, and we rejoice because God is rejoicing. That's what the church was always meant to be. So why don't we do that? I don't know. But we have to gain perspective from the Word of God and we have to repent and be what Jesus Christ wants us to be. As soon as we lose our perspective on our purpose for existence, that's when it all starts to fall apart. And that's just the, that's just the reality of it. Rejoice with me because I found my lost sheep. In the same way, there's more joy in heaven over one lost sinner who repents and returns to God than over 99 others who are righteous and have not strayed away. There's no such thing as a self-righteous person. But the point is, is when we repent, it's one of those old church words, what does repent mean? Think in terms of a military about face. We turn 180 degrees. So, so much of life, we, a, a couple weeks ago I talked to you about influence. There's a lot of influences out there that are trying to draw you away from God. And they're trying to pull you to a place, whether it be mentally, spiritually, or, or the way that we live our lives, 
trying to draw you into a place that is apart from God. And repentance is when you say no, and you turn, and you return back to God. That is repentance. Repentance kind of sounds like one of those old, scary church words. But it's really pretty simple. It's a turning back to God. He says there's more joy in heaven over one lost sinner who repents and returns to God than over 99 others who are righteous and have not strayed away. So in our repentance, God is made happy. God is not made happy by religious rituals. He's not made happy by religiosity or churchianity. He is made happy by repentance. And He is filled with joy when we repent. And just so we know, I don't care where you're at on your journey here today, repentance never ends. Sometimes we repent every day, every hour, all continuously as Christians. Now there may be that first big moment of repentance, which could be a salvational moment for a lot of people. And that's a, that's a big deal. But ultimately, it's this idea of people turning back to God. And that's what we should continuously be doing throughout our lives, all the time, day after day, minute after minute, hour after hour, we are repenting and turning back to God. Now Jesus tells another story uh, as, he, as he throws that out there. Then he tells one other story. Uh, in, uh, he begins in verse 8. He says, suppose a woman has ten silver coins and loses one. Won't she light a lamp and sweep the entire house and search carefully until she finds it? So again, the characters. Who's the woman? Jesus. Who's the coin? We are. Now, what is that ten coins? What, what is that? What's the point of that? Let, let me explain to you culturally how we connect to that. Those ten coins represent her dowry or think of it in terms of an engagement ring. So how many of you women, if you lost your engagement ring, would search and search every, every nook and cranny you could until you found it? And that's, that's the same picture. So, so suppose a woman has ten silver coins and loses one, won't she light a lamp and sweep the entire house and search carefully till she finds it? And when she finds it, she will call in her friends and neighbors and say, rejoice with me. Again, that's that picture of the church. Now last week, we had our celebration Sunday. We had 11 baptisms here last week. We had 16 participants. We had uh, testimonies. We had all of these things. And I'll tell you what, the, the joy of the Lord was off the charts. It was unbelievable. And I, I, I say these things, I, I don't, you know, if you weren't there last week, I, you know, I, you prob- I'm sure you have your reasons for not being there. But I'm telling you, it was unbelievable. And, I, I, and, and, and it, to me, what, what weeks like we had last week is it's, it's that culmination of Jesus' mission here at The Way. And so I always know that every Celebration Sunday, the joy factor, I mean, it's always joy here, don't get me wrong. But on Celebration Sunday, it's gonna blow, it, it about blows the roof off this place. Because Jesus is delighting in what's happening. He's delighting in the celebration Sunday. And that's the whole point of our celebration Sunday. We are getting in line with the rejoicing that takes place in heaven. She searches until she finds it. And when she finds it, she'll call in her friends and neighbors and say, rejoice with me because I found my lost coin In the same way, there is joy in the presence of God's angels when even one sinner repents. I want to show you a video um, that helps us with our perspective. Uh, Before I do, I just want to tell you a couple things about it. Several years ago, here at The Way, we had a a directory made. And um, in that directory, uh, as a part of that, they, they actually had this thing that they would do or they would take all the pictures of the people in the directory and they'd put them together as a mosaic. And um, if you walk out this door and you turn to your left, you'll see the picture right there is our mosaic that, with all the pictures of people from the church. Oh, a, a, they asked us, what, what picture would you like it to be? 
And as we thought about it, we tried to think of a picture that best represents the way. And the picture that we came up with was the picture of Jesus from the Passion of the Christ, where it's, it's the part where the, the, adulter, the woman caught in the act of adultery is brought before Jesus, and um, they're ready to stone her. And they're asking Jesus, should we stone her? And Jesus reaches down, and he writes something in the sand, and then he stands up, he looks at them, and he says, let any person who's without sin cast the first stone. And so our picture is that picture of Jesus drawing in the dirt. Now you know the story of the woman in adul- adultery is, is they, they leave. Jesus turns to the woman, says to her, daughter, where, where are those who, who are here to condemn you? What has happened to them? And she says, well, they've all left. And Jesus said, well, neither do I condemn you. Now go and sin no more. And it's this beautiful picture of redemption and the heart of Jesus. And so this video, um, it's a song that came out many years ago. We showed it here in the church about five years ago. We were first kind of getting together. Uh, and I just think it's worth seeing again because I think it speaks to who Christ has called us to be as a church. So I'm going to play this video for you, and I hope that it blesses you. So enjoy this video. You know, I, uh, I watched that video, and I, I'll tell you the way I connect to it is all those pictures of people laying on the street and people being lost. I take one of my own children, and I put them there. And I'll tell you what, it just, the idea of that happening to my child, it just breaks my heart. But I'll tell you what, as much as I love my kids, Jesus loves people more. And see, that, you've got to understand the heart of our God. And for you that are here, maybe you're, I don't know, maybe you know the Lord, maybe you don't. But if you know Him, you have to know His heart. And if you don't know Him, you've got to know His heart. It's to love people. And it's to bring them in and to shepherd them and offer them safety and security and, and, and to give them this life of abundance that's free from harm and free from uh, these things that destroy us. As a church, we have to know that that's Jesus' mission. And if we make it anything other than that, we're going to miss it. We're going to miss it. Every so often I get wrapped up in things, uh, you know, it's just kind of the way life works. And I thank God for those moments that gets my head right. Well, this is one of those moments. It's one of those moments where we as a people have to know what Jesus' ultimate desire is and what he's doing so that we can take part in it. I'm going to leave you with one last statement as the praise team comes up. I'm going to pray for us in just a moment. But there's an old saying when it comes to to being the church and, and loving on people. And, and, and it's, it's pretty simple, but it's something that we always need to remember. People will never care to know, they'll never care what you know until they know that you care. Let me say that again. People will never care what you know until they know that you care. So the first step in all of this, if you're talking about action steps, is to be a people of compassion, a people who care And we don't just walk by people. We're not in a hurry to get from point A to point B, but we put ourselves in places where we can be used by God. So we're going to go into a time of worship here in a moment. Uh, Before we do that, I want to pray for us. But be thinking about ways that God might be calling you uh, to get in step with His mission. So let me pray for us. Father God, I thank You for Your Word today. And Lord, I thank You for a good, hard dose of perspective. I know that there are people here today that have known you for a long time and through various uh, situations in their life, Lord, their relationship with you has has gone in many different directions. But my prayer for them today is that they would know how beloved they truly are, that they would know that that you you went through the cross for them and that you love them deeply. I pray that they would be able to feel the depths of your love. And Lord, my prayer is for people here today that, that have never turned to you. Lord, they've never, uh, I don't know, maybe they just came because somebody invited them, or, or maybe they came because 
some things have been going on in their life. But Lord, I just pray that now they would know the way has been made. They're free to turn to you. I pray that if they are so inclined to do so, Lord, and that they would. And if they need to, to come forward and pray with somebody, they would do that as well. But Lord, at this time of response, we just want to feel your love. We want to feel your heart. So help us to do that. We pray this in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. So we're going to move into a time of response. As always, uh, communion's available. If you'd like to come forward and receive that. We have prayer ministers up here in the front row that would love to pray for you. If you're here and maybe you've never, maybe you've never turned to the Lord ever and you're not sure what to do, you can come forward. And, and I'll pray with you. They can pray with you. We want to invite you uh, to be a part of this. And maybe, maybe you just need somebody to pray for you and pray a blessing over you. They're available as well. So communion. But let's, let's together, let's worship the Lord for this last song. You know, part of my job is I get these phone calls sometimes during the week, and, and it, goes, it, it goes something like this. I have somebody in my life who I deeply care for that's, that's making some bad decisions and I don't know what to do. Um, and, you know, so often there, there's this feeling of hopelessness and there's the, all these things that go with it. And, you know, the reality, it's the same answer for everything. I mean, it, I know it comes, it comes in different ways. But ultimately, the answer is that people need a shepherd. We, we just... We, we just get lost, we're prone to wander, we go down paths that aren't good for us. And I know that in our pride, that's, that's not a great thing to think about. But open your eyes. Look at, these, these are not people making decisions because they're horrible people. These are people making decisions because they're lost. And, and we've got to stop vilifying people that do certain things and understanding that apart from Christ, we're all in the same club. We're all in the same club. And we need to start offering grace and love and compassion. Never compromising on the holiness of God. We'll never change who God is and what He stands for. But everyone is invited to know Him and allow Him to change their lives. And let us never, ever forget that. People will never care what you know until they first know that you care. So please stand. Receive the blessing as I dismiss you here today. As you leave and you go out into the world and whatever awaits you, may you leave here now knowing the love of God the Father, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ the Son, and the fellowship and the power of the Holy Spirit now and always. God bless you. You're dismissed. Have a good week.